comments anyone has? I did a lot of talk in the first part, so. Let me see if I got this uh, process right. Okay. If I look at something and I know it's either going to give me pleasure <clears throat> or pain, I know it's the ego working, right? Right. So then I say, uh, I ask Jesus to let me go back to that, do that. And, and the only way I can find out that I'm really using the Holy Spirit's way is to realize no matter what happens, it's not going to affect me. Right. And also, don't judge yourself for, for giving power to something in the world to give you pleasure or pain. That's, that's what's important. In other words, if you're really looking with Jesus above the battleground, then you're going to look down on the dream and you'll smile at it. And if you do anything else but smile at it, you're making it real and taking it seriously. Remember, uh, we'll look at this passage later, but the, but the line that we always quote, into eternity we're always one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. And so anything that you make real in this world, which means you give it power to either make you happy or sad, anything is a projected shadow or a shadowy fragment of the tiny mad idea. Because the tiny mad idea is separation. So if I think there's something out there that can affect me positively or negatively, obviously I believe in separation. I'm here and there's that something out there that can affect me. So it's all a, a form of the tiny mad idea. So, so remember that line. The problem was not the tiny mad idea. The problem was we took it seriously. All right. The problem was we looked at the tiny mad idea of separating effect from cause and we put a slash mark there. Right. That was the problem. Right. What the Holy Spirit does is that he looks at that and just smiles because he knows that the line between cause and effect between God and Christ has never been broken. Therefore, that's the model you want to take. So you want to look at any expression of the tiny mad idea, on any form, anything that, that, that either breathes of separation, anything, and smile at it. The smile means, because it's not the physical smile, the smile means this has no power to take away the love or the peace of God from me. Here, here again is where the whole idea of purpose becomes extremely important. What this course does that no other spirituality has ever done is not only describe the ego thought system and the illusory nature of the world, but it helps us understand the purpose that it serves, why there is a world and why there is a, a personal world for all of us. It serves the purpose of keeping us mindless. Which is another way of saying it serves the purpose of keeping us not being responsible. Because the mind is the source of responsibility. In fact, there is only the mind. This entire world is found within this blue circle. Just, just as whatever you dream at night, however cosmic your dream might be, it still is in the mind of you, the dreamer. Well, it's no different with the physical universe. It is literally a dream. Jesus means that. This is, not, this is not true. And it all exists right here in this blue circle. And it's only when, again, we could return our attention to that blue circle that we understand that. That's what it means to be above the battleground. It's in that blue circle. Because when you're above the battleground with Jesus, the decision maker becomes an observer. When you're in your right mind, the decision maker is an observer. There are so many passages in this course that describe the process of looking. You know, one of the ones I always quote because it is such a, a wonderfully succinct summary is forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. It merely looks and waits and judges not. So, what forgiveness does is it comes back here above the battleground and does nothing. Because why should you do something about, it, about something that doesn't exist? Why fix something that's not there? When an individual does that, we call that person schizophrenic. Right? That's why Jesus tells us over and over in this course we are insane. We are hallucinating. That's the word he uses, hallucinating. We're trying to fix something here. The, everything here in red is made up. Everything. Everything in blue is made up too. But it's a correction for what, what the ego has made. 
What forgiveness does is it goes back to this point above the, the battleground. It's quiet and still does nothing. It looks on the ego thought system, waits for us to identify with, a, with our role as being a decision maker, and above all, doesn't judge. It says, yes, this is devastation, this is sin, this is guilt, this is fear, this is murder, but it's all made up. Not one note in heaven's song was missed. Ideas leave not their source. Nothing happened. So take all these statements and put them together. The miracle establishes that we are dreaming a dream, and it's not true. The miracle looks on devastation, says it's not true. Forgiveness looks on all of this and says it's not worthy to judge. There's nothing here to judge. The only judgment is that there's nothing here to judge. That's why Jesus says this course is very simple. What makes it so difficult is the concept that Freud was the first one to have articulated, the concept of resistance. We are resisting the simple truth. We are, are resisting what Jesus says in the last chapter, the simplicity of salvation. We want to make it complicated. Christian theology has made salvation incredibly complicated. It is very simple. You may look on the dream, and you smile sweetly and gently and say, this has had no effect on anything. That's all you do. You don't change it. You don't fix it. You simply look, and you don't judge. As we'll see, see later, what this means specifically is you look on the egos of other people, and you don't judge, and you look on your ego, and you don't judge. But you look at the ego. You can't say it's an illusion until you first look at it. This is from, from the, the Dynamics of the Ego on page 202. Uh, this is where, where the line comes that I already quoted about uh, having the lamp with Jesus that will dispel the ego. Just look at, at sentence five and six. The dynamics of the ego will be our lesson for a while, for we must look first at this to see beyond it, since you have made it real. All right, here again, he's setting forth the whole program of his course. Together, you and I, he tells us, will look at the ego. Not because it's real, but because you have made it real. And so we first must look at it in order to see beyond it. And then he, makes it, he says it again. We will undo this error quietly together. And then look beyond it to the truth. You can't get to the truth until you first look at the error. This is not a course in love, in beauty, in truth, in peace, in joy. This is a course in looking at the error. It's looking at the devastation of the ego thought system. And when you look at it with him, you will then look beyond it because you will then realize you're looking at nothing. As he says later in the text, sin is not a solid wall of granite. It's a tiny wisp of black smoke without the power to keep the light that shines beyond it from shining through. Another place, he talks about the clouds of guilt. And he says, these have no power. A cloud can't even hold a button. A button will fall through a cloud because a cloud is nothing. We think, we think it takes away the sun, but all it does is hide it. That's what guilt is. That's what the ego thought system is. It has no power to keep the light away from us. But you won't know that if you don't look. And you first must acknowledge there is something there that you're looking at, which means you must acknowledge the ego in you. Not the egos in everybody else. There is no everybody else. Everything is a projection of what is in the mind. So we use what we have projected to get back to the source of the projection. That's how Jesus turns the tables on the ego. The ego uses projection to preserve itself. Jesus takes projection to turn it back inward and say the world which is a projection, is an outward picture of an inward condition. That's the hope. And back inside the mind, we could finally get back to the cause. And once we are back to the cause, we could change it. I can't change the cause of distress by trying to change something in the world. It's exactly what the ego wants. I can only change the cause of distress and pain by going back to its source, which is in the mind. And that's the cause.